There are two prisoners shackled to the wall of a deep, dark dungeon cell. Spread-eagled, they're securely fastened by manacles and chains and actually suspended a bit side by side above the damp floor of the dungeon. There's only one small window high above their heads, maybe 30, 40 feet up. They are immobile and alone, pinned inexorably to the wall. One of them turns to the other and whispers, Here's my plan. Oh, yes, we love the optimism, don't we? We need that kind of optimism sometimes in this life. One of the great things about Nehemiah was his optimism. And he was certainly a man with a plan. We are studying through Nehemiah in this series entitled, Let Us Rise Up and Build. It's a good time to be thinking about building and rebuilding, uh, considering our circumstances. And uh, it's always a good, good time to be thinking about that as people in God's church, uh, but even just in general. And there are great principles to be learned about this, sort of deeply embedded in the text of Scripture, and especially in the book of Nehemiah, this man whose name is sort of synonymous with being a builder. But before we open up Nehemiah, I want to establish this idea first in the New Testament, this principle of having a mind to work and, and building, and this theme of let us rise up and build. It's not unique to the pages of Nehemiah. It is a God thing. And so it's found throughout God's book and, of course, throughout the New Testament as well. In fact, the title of this particular session is The Builder of All Things, and it's straight out of the New Testament text. I'm thinking especially of the book of Hebrews chapter 3. Now, remember the opening chapters of Hebrews and, and what they're all about. They're all about lifting Jesus up, exalting Jesus. Jesus, the Son of God, is above all things. He's better than everything and everyone. And so in chapter 3 of Hebrews, the comparison is with Moses. There was no greater Old Testament hero than Moses. He was the great leader of Israel out of Egypt, the one who brought them out out of slavery, the one who delivered the law to them and, and wrote down the first five books of what we know as the Old Testament. So Moses was certainly great, but compared with Christ, he comes in a distant second. So listen to these opening words of Hebrews 3 uh, in, in this line of thought. It says there, Therefore, holy brothers, you who share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, who was faithful to him, who appointed him, just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house. So the point again is to consider Jesus, but Moses is mentioned too, and he was no doubt special and great. But, but here's how the point is driven home in verses 3 and 4. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Well, I, I love the picture there, don't you? Um, you get... The point, and we often get it backwards. We see some great structure, uh, maybe a beautiful house, or even a great business, um, or whatever it might be, and we think, 
wow, how awesome that is, how awesome that building is, how often do we think about the one who built it? How often do we consider the builder um, the one without whom it would not exist, you see? This is the point of the Hebrew writer. Yes, Moses did great things, but nothing compared to Jesus. Man sometimes builds impressive things, but the builder of all things is God. Have you thought about God as the great builder? You know, he built mankind. Go back to Genesis chapter 2. When God makes Adam, he forms or shapes him from the dust of the ground. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And then we know that he takes a rib from the side of Adam and, and later builds Eve with it. So God is depicted as building humanity. He is the builder of all things. Later on in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11, you know, when it's talking about the faith of all the great patriarchs and the heroes of Scripture, um, when it's talking about the faith of Abraham, part of it is verse 10, Hebrews 11:10. Part of it, Abraham's great faith was that he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. Uh, referring to heaven, um, God built earth, and God has built heaven. He is the great builder of all things. One other New Testament passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10. The writer, of course, is Paul, and he's talking about his work um, of planting a church in the city of Corinth. And as he discusses that, he says the following. He says, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take, take care how he builds upon it. Now, when we think of Paul, we, we think great things. Uh, he, he did incredible work as a missionary and great work there among the Corinthian people. And it almost sounds like he takes credit for it in verse 10. But he doesn't really, because I didn't read the first phrase of that verse. Because the first phrase of that verse, the apostle says, according to the grace of God given to me. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. That's really the key. He gave credit to the great builder of all things, who is God. Well, here again is the point. God is a builder by nature. Uh, he wants to build things. He, he wants to build things for us, in us. And he wants to build the church, just like he did in Corinth. Remember what Paul said, really just a few verses earlier than where we read there in 1 Corinthians 3. I bet you can quote all of it, or at least a part of it. He said of his work there in that city, I planted, Apollos watered, but what? Can you finish that phrase? Yes, God gave the increase. God brought the growth. So he goes on, he says, So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. And here's the point, even more clearly stated. The Lord wants to bless us and give us great things. He wants to build us if he can trust us not to steal the glory for ourselves. I think that deserves repetition. The Lord wants to build us and will if 
He can trust us not to take the glory that only he deserves. He is the builder of all things, you see. So, let's get back to Nehemiah. You may have thought I forgot about him. Nehemiah had great plans. He had detailed plans, important plans. But more important than all of that was the fact that God's hand was behind it all. And, and Nehemiah acknowledges this and says so repeatedly. The first place he does so is in chapter 2 and verse 8. He says, For the good hand of God was upon me. Then just a few verses later, verse 11, he says, I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. You see, whose plans were these really? Nehemiah's? No. God's. God put it into his heart. God is the builder of all things. Chapter 2, verse 18. The God of heaven, it says, will make us prosper, and we, are, and we his servants will arise and build. You see, in that verse, you have the right order, uh, the correct priority. God the builder, we his servants. We plant, someone else waters, God gives the increase. Continuing through Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. That's just pretty good worship material there, isn't it? Also in chapter 4, verse 20. Our God will fight for us. Chapter 5, verse 13. And all the assembly said, Amen and praise the Lord. Chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of the month in 52 days. And when all our enemies heard of it, all the nations around us were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem, for they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. Even those who witnessed it from afar recognized who the builder was. And then chapter 12, verse 43. It's after the walls have been built. In fact, it's at the, the dedication ceremony. It says this, And they offered great sacrifices that day and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy, and the joy of Jerusalem was heard far away. Even their joyful celebration of worship is credited to God. God built that. Now, they didn't build that. God did. Well, I hope it's clear, the point, because it's really, really important. Before we even talk in this study about how they physically went about building the walls and, and everything they had to overcome to do so, and all the opposition, uh, the activity of their enemies, and all those things, it's important to establish this truth. God is the builder of all things. And, friends, as we work to build, rebuild, as we work in God's kingdom, and, you know, we struggle, and we sweat, and we pray, and we worship, and we wield the sword of the Spirit, and we deal with opposition and enemies, and we just get down in the dirt and mire and, and put brick on top of brick. We need to recognize who's in charge, who the work leader is, in fact, who the real builder is. 
And we had better be willing to give him the glory and the credit all the way along the process. Or he just might choose not to build here. That's how serious this is. What can prevent the growth that I think we all desire and would love to see? Glory stealing from God. It's getting puffed up. Standing back and saying, look what I did. Look what we did. No. What we need to do is say, look what God is doing. The psalmist said, Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. Come and hear all you who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for my soul. Psalm 66. That, folks, is what we need to be about as we rise up and build. Telling others what God has done for our soul. Pointing others to the work of God amongst us. Giving God all the credit and all the glory that he deserves. If God can trust us to do that, I am convinced that he will build great things amongst us. Way back in the 1800s, there was a rancher who walked into the general store of a frontier town on the Great Plains, and he asked the owner there for credit for supplies that he needed. The storekeeper asked, doing any fencing this, this spring, Jake? The rancher replied, sure am, Will. Fencing in or fencing out, asked the storekeeper. Answered the rancher, fencing in, taking in another 350 acres across the creek. The storekeeper said, good to hear it, Jake. You have the credit. Just tell Henry out back what you need. Well, there was a visitor that overheard the whole conversation and he commented to the storekeeper that this seemed like a, an unusual credit system. Will said, it works. If a man's fencing out, he's running scared with what he's got. If he's fencing in, he's hopeful. I always give credit to a man who's fencing in. That's one way of thinking about this principle. Are we fencing in or fencing out? That is, are we living with hope? Are we taking in some more acreage this year? God will credit us if we don't steal his glory. It, it's just no way to live to just be fencing out just protecting what we got, just hunkering down and waiting for Jesus to return. We were not made in Christ Jesus to live that way. So let us rise up and build. And may we make sure to recognize and remember who the real builder of all things is.